A private organization has launched a statewide campaign to improve the odds of success for minority-led charters. What should parents shopping for a charter school look for in any school? We'll talk about both next on Black Issues Forum. Quality public television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV. Hello, welcome to Black Issues Forum. I'm Deborah Holt Noel. Thanks for joining us. With the cap on public charter schools now lifted, a private organization has launched a statewide campaign to improve the odds of success for minority led charters. This move intends to benefit would be minority leaders in the long run, but what can these schools' potential student bodies expect in the short run? The answer to this question may be increasingly visited as more parents consider charter schools for their children. And today's guests have great experience to lend to the conversation. Let's get started. I'd like to introduce Daryl Allison, president of Parents for Educational Freedom in North Carolina. Rodney Ellis, Vice President of North Carolina Ed Association of Educators, and Simon Johnson, Chief Executive Officer of Quality Education Academy in Winston-Salem, a charter school that recently won the distinction of Honor School of Excellence. Congratulations on that, Mr. Johnson. Thank you very much. Uh, we were excited about doing that and uh, our ambition is to continue to do that and to move forward with the consistency in that uh, for our school. And that's important uh, not only for us as an individual but also for minority schools. Well today's discussion is inspired by the the disappointing news that many minority-led uh, charter schools are actually failing. Daryl, Share with us how serious the issue is. Yeah, I wouldn't say that uh, uh, many of our minority-led uh, charter schools are failing. What I'll say to you, uh, Deborah, is that uh, we don't have enough of them, particularly when we look at uh, the achievement gap challenges in, in many of our urban uh, districts as well as our rural. Uh, we're, we're, what are we going to do for those, those children, Latino, uh, Afro American, Native American, so that they too can have access to a quality option? Um, uh, when you look at the 40,000 uh, children that are currently uh, educated in our public charter schools, uh, only 27% of them are children of color. Uh, and so what we want to make sure uh, in our organization, yeah, we, we support the ideal of uh, public charter schools, but one of the things I always like to say is that we want quality charter schools. That's the end of the day, that's what we're out, because at the end of the day, it doesn't make a difference if a child is in a public charter school or a traditional school. Uh, if that school is severely lacking, we all lose, the family, the child, the family, and that community. And so uh, there are some things that we're looking at and making sure on the front end that we can better ensure, ensure success on the trajectory for those minority leaders across the state that, that endeavor uh, to, to start a charter school. I'd like to get back to the point about minority-led charters not succeeding at the rate that we'd like to see them succeed. Um, Simon, can you talk a little bit about um, what the rate of success is or the rate of failure? Well, <clears throat> in recent years, I, I think there's reasonable parity between the uh, minority-led charter schools and other schools. Minority-led charter schools have a great uh, disadvantage usually in terms of startup. And what happens is, uh, typically speaking, uh, a group of concerned citizens start a school and they usually try to start it small, something they can get their arms around and manage. But unfortunately, uh, the, the, the cost for startup is heaviest on the front end. And so what you find is they find themselves engaged in trying to make ends meet more than they do in terms of focusing on the student needs and student achievement. Because we don't have alternative resources, as many other majority schools do, then this must be borne out by the individuals in the school, either to go out and try to raise funds or to suffer because of lack of funds. And so that contributes to uh, what some of us call that failure rate. But I think uh, minority schools with the resources we have and the startup costs 
of starting a school do a tremendous job in terms of being able just to survive the first two or three years and then show some progress and a trend of going upwards from there. Now, uh, Rodney, the, the NCAE did not support uh, the lifting of the cap on charter schools. Did that have anything to do with concern over the rate of success of charter schools? Well, certainly that's one of the factors. Um, we did do some research and we realized that, that many of the charter schools were not performing at the level that we like to see them perform. And I guess our greatest fear was the possibility that you would have charter schools just springing up all over the state with uh, no accountability, nobody uh, providing the oversight necessary to make sure that these schools are actually being successful. So, Yeah, I, I like to add to that, and, and along with um, uh, what Mr. Johnson was sharing, there is some data. Um, of the 33 charter schools that's been shut down since 1996, um, almost 40% of them were minority-led. And when we mean by minority-led, Deborah, uh, we're not only talking about the leader of their school being of color. Uh, and again, not just Afro-American, but Latino, Native American, but also that the, the school board, uh, the private charter, the charter school board is mostly minority, uh, majority minority as well. And when you look at the fact that of the 33 charter schools that were shut down in 1996, uh, some folks get alarmed by that. I say that's not too bad because, again, if they're not up to par, they need to be shut down. Nearly 40 percent of those schools were minority-led. When we contacted the Department of Public Instruction and asked the reason, what are the top three reasons why uh, these schools failed, if you will, financial accountability, uh, the lack of sufficient board governance, and a uh, real uh, lack of a strong strategic long-term plan. And so my thought is, in order for us to, to remedy that, that if we can begin to focus in on those critical areas, uh, along with Mr. Johnson was sharing, along with bringing, making sure that we have the right leadership, a dynamic leader in the school leading it, uh, a good governing board uh, surrounding that dynamic leader in those communities, whether it be rural or urban, then we'll see the, a, a better success rate. I believe across our state and take advantage of this opportunity that's been afforded us with elimination of capital and public charter schools. Well with the startup costs being one of the major uh, obstacles, challenges, how are you suggesting uh, startups get around that? Well I, I can tell you that we were very excited and, and um, we have partnered with a national social venture capital uh, fund. Uh, the name is Partners for Development Futures. We just finished a a statewide tour of four cities uh, where this national organization, just for the issues that we just shared, they look nationally. It's not only here in, in the state. We have over 5,000 charter schools across our nation, and they've seen that trend that in those uh, areas that need options the most for families, low income, most minority, they've seen this, this issue here on the front end. And so the Social Venture Capitalist Fund has decided uh, to, to look at North Carolina and be of assistance on the front end identifying a great uh, dynamic school leader, uh, make sure that uh, we equip them with the, the right board development uh, and, and strategic planning and provide that necessary startup funding, significant funding. Since uh, the last two years that they've been in existence, they've, they've given millions of dollars across the nation. And so we're very fortunate uh, to have them partner with us. And so again, our hope is to get the information out, bring those type of leaders together, a businessman, uh, because public charter schools, you need to be business minded as well as education, ABCs, one, two, threes. You've got to be mindful of the dollar. Bring together the legal uh, uh, assistance that you need and bring those educators around the table. We think that that, uh, along with the startup's uh, financial uh, support that a charter school needs, we think that, that that helps along, along the way. Simon, I want to get you in here again to talk about what were the I imagine you faced the same challenges we that did. any startup would. How did you get around it to become an honor school of excellence? Well, uh, well, of course, naturally that comes from just having an excellent staff of people to work with. And that occurs over time. You know, we didn't instantly start off as a, an honor school of excellence. It was through years of work and recruiting the right people and bringing the right people into the, uh, into the arena and then having proper training for them again. All of that is tied to financing or the lack of financing, the rate that you can do that and how well you can do that. And so we were fortunate in a number of cases to reach out and uh, get some financing through grants and, and such areas as that. And I'm just delighted to see what uh, Daryl and his organization are doing to provide that, that first financing because the first year of charter schools 
we did not receive any funds until the middle of October. And so we had staff working on faith that they would be paid. Well, that sort of brings up the issue of the fact that, you know, well, yes, you need this time to start up, and any business would, but the clients who are coming through are the children of, of citizens, and, and everybody wants the best education for their child. So what's happening to the quality of education for these kids who are coming through while you all are, while the charter schools are working out their kinks? Well, I think uh, in the areas that you're talking about, you know, there was a study that was performed and it talked about the tw top 28 things that contributed the most to student learning. And those types of things are sort of secondary. The, the most important thing in terms of a child learning is the type of teacher that's in the classroom with that child. And so when you, when you, when you work on that, that's something that you can work on have a fairly level playing field in that in terms of the financial aspect of that. Because most charter schools have to pay a competitive salary for teachers just as traditional public schools do. Rodney, is this something, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the top 28 uh, mm -hmm. items, but, but what is it that the, that the NCAE would say that parents need to be looking for as they examine um, charter schools as an option for their children? Well, I think you have to start first by looking at the school success rate on the AYP. Um, I think you have to also check in, uh, check into the teacher turnover rate because when you find a lot of teachers uh, leaving the school each year, you know there's got to be some problems there. And so I would want to see a school where, or parents would need to look for a school where the staff has been in place for a number of years and they continue to work with the students and continue to see growth and development academically in the students. Um, I think you need to look for community support and find out what the community is doing to back that school because I think in any school period, what be it uh, traditional public schools or charter public charter schools, I think that you have to have the community support, the parental involvement to make sure that those students are going to get every opportunity they can to succeed. How is community support measured? How do you investigate that? Well, you look at the active involvement uh, of members of the community in terms of uh, local businesses that may uh, come out and uh, either offer funding to help support the school or uh, manpower, any of those things that the, that the business community can provide for the school, uh, partnerships in helping them uh, work out any issues or challenges that the school may have. Um, you know, in, for example, you have a school that does not have uh, playground facilities or something. You might partner with a local recreation center that does have those playground facilities so that the students can go and get the physical exercise that they need. So uh, I think that there's a, a huge value to having um, uh, the community support uh, in terms of the businesses, in terms of the local churches, and anything in the community that could uh, help support the education of the students there. So it really takes that parent doing some homework. Yes, it does. <laughs> That's correct. That's before correct. Before their child has to do that homework. That's right. That's right. And when you look at the fact of a public charter school, unlike your traditional schools, typically, parents choose that school, right? In our traditional system, you know, you're, you're pretty much zoned to that school. And so you have, I don't care if that parent is, is wealthy, middle class, or low income, uh, the parents that are going, deciding to attend quality education uh, academy there in Winston-Salem, despite their income, they, they have a mindset. They, they've done that research. They, they've heard and listened around the community. And again, we're talking about a school at the highest level uh, that you can be granted in the state of North Carolina. Word gets out, word of mouth. You know, you, know, you have rumors and, and, and the negative talk, but the, the reverse of that happens, right? That, that when we hear about successes happening, people flock to that. People, people go to that. You do the investigation. And that's one of the byproducts, I believe, of, of allowing uh, for the elimination of the cap on public charter schools. Not that public charter schools are more superior, but all of us can understand that one size, one way does not adequately address all the issues uh, that our children face. And so by providing another option, we want to make sure it's a quality option. Uh, the more quality options that uh, our children have, our families have on the table to best act, you know, provide education for the children, we believe all boats rise on the tide. Well, uh, I think it's real important to focus on the things that actually make a difference in student achievement. And I think a lot of times we're distracted by things that have sort of become buzzwords and terms that we use. Uh, I don't remember all of the things on the top 28 list, but I remember number 28 and I remember the top five or six. Number 28 that had the least effect 
was district demographics. That is, what race the child is in, the socioeconomic background the child comes from, and all of those things that we constantly talk about as reasons for children failing. The child is the least reason for failing. The greatest reason for student failure is the classroom teacher and how well that classroom teacher is prepared and how well the administrators work to bring continuous improvement to instructional delivery. So it's important that we focus on things that make a difference and not just on things that are popular sayings. Well, in that same vein, uh, Daryl was saying that it was important to have more minority-led schools. How do you uh, evaluate or how do you make that statement when what's important is that there are quality <coughs> teachers in the classroom? Why does it matter or how much does it matter uh, that they are minority-led schools? I, look, I, I, I'm not necessarily saying that you, you have to you know, be a minority-led school in order for a child that's of color. To, to learn adequately. What I am saying, look, look at the statistics. Of the 40,000 families, children, that are educated in public charter school, only 27% of them are, are minorities. Of the 100 charter schools that currently exist in North Carolina, only 28% of them are leaders of, of schools that are led by minorities. And when we look at the fact, uh, Deborah, that only 47 counties uh, encompasses those 100 charter schools, we're talking about 53 counties that do not have a charter school. Those are people, whether it be rural or urban. And so what, what I say is a real disadvantage, right, when we say that this is an opportunity for all children, for all children, and that's not necessarily the case. When we're talking about starting a charter school in a low-income district, and when we're talking about starting a charter school in a rural uh, a county where the resources aren't necessarily there, it's critical. It's critical that we find a way to where, again, we can provide this option. Why is it that a child that maybe happen, may happen to be in Charlotte has 13 public charter schools as well as traditional schools to pick from, but a child in Halifax County doesn't have that option? Again, the more quality options that are on the table uh, for our children, the better the chances for success. And so it's critically important, right, that we have the teachers in the classroom, but it's but also we have to take in those considerations as well. And so that we can strategically take advantage of this opportunity for all of our children, particularly our, our children of color. Simon? They're not really uh, separated things. They're, they're distinctly tied together. When you start, uh, and for example, in anything, there's a strategy for wherever you are. If, uh, if a coach is coaching a team, no matter what the sport, there's a strategy for when you are leading and there's a strategy for when you are behind. Well, typically speaking, minority students are behind. The achievement gap shows this. So there's a strategy that needs to be implemented in order to close that gap and supersede that gap when possible, as we did. And that strategy needs to come from people who are sensitive to what it means to be behind and what it takes to catch up and to exceed the gap. If you're dealing with people in leadership who've always been in the lead and their constituents have always been in the lead, there's a greater possibility that that sensitivity is not there. And so those children and that quality teacher that I'm talking about in that classroom is selected by the leaders of the school, directly or indirectly. And so they tie together in that then when the leadership of the school is led of a minority school is led by minorities then they are sensitive to the needs that it takes to catch up and what it takes to catch up and to exceed in uh, in achieving rodney what would you say to that i think he's hit the nail on the head i mean i think it is important that we have uh folks in the school who can relate to the population of the school and who understand the challenges that they face and who are able to provide the type of uh, leadership and guidance that the students need now, are the criteria, the qualifications of uh, educators within public charter schools the same as for non-charter schools? Well, no, I think that they, the, the state has a requirement that 75 um, percent, and I think that's in elementary school, if I'm not mistaken, are licensed, uh, are licensed educators, and then 50 percent in the high schools. So there is a little uh, difference, but as I reviewed the statistics, most of the charter schools throughout the state are actually at or above at least 70 percent of the staff being uh, certified staff. So, um, yeah. So the money makes a big difference. It does. That startup. Yeah. It, it, it does. It, it, it does. And, and to the achievement gap, uh, it's, it's really important. You know, again, w nobody's just beating the drum to say bring on more public charter schools for public charter schools' sake. 2001, when you, when you look at the performance of white students in 2001, 
84%. And when you group that number of, 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 of children of color, uh, Native American, Latino, and Afro American, there was a 24% gap achievement difference. Fast track 10 years to 2010, we put millions of dollars to, 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 to try to shorten that gap up. We came up with a number of different programs, new names. Uh, in 2010, that gap not only remained, but it increased to 28 percent, from 24 percent to 28 percent for those children of color, those kids, those families of color. The, 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 the situation has worsened. And so when we talk about public charter schools, along with what Rodney's saying in terms of, no, they don't necessarily have to have the same teacher certification, these public charter schools need to be flexible. These schools are flexible, more flexible than our traditional schools. They're more in tune with the community because it is a community uh, of leaders that are starting that public charter school. And I believe that done right, with the right resources, the right leaders at the helm, we will begin to chip away uh, at that achievement gap, just as what uh, Mr. Johnson has been able to do in, 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 uh, in Winston-Salem. And we hope that now we've eliminated the cap on public charter schools, he has mine uh, to spread some of that wealth in these other counties. we got 53 well, counties, Mr. Scoop. Johnson. How about it? <laughs> <laughs> He's not talking. <laughs> <laughs> we certainly want to help wherever we can. And, 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 and really, the whole purpose, one of the original purposes of charter schools when they started, I remember distinctly, was the fact that charters would serve as a laboratory from which uh, traditional public schools could draw the best out of charter schools. And now I think that we need to, you know, likewise have an exchange going both ways where we draw the best out of traditional public schools and they draw the best out of charter schools. And, and I'm happy to, you know, to be on this, uh, on this uh, show with uh, Rodney here because uh, he's in a leadership position for the largest education organization in the state. And certainly, you know, if we can come to some terms and understanding and his organization and Daryl's organization, then that's a step in the right direction. How is the exchange? Uh, <clears throat> is, is, is there a good, a strong communication uh, network going on between uh, public schools? And I know that charter schools are also public schools, mm -hmm. but is that exchange, that uh, positive exchange going, actually happening and and if it's not what would strengthen it what would help well, it I don't think that right now that um, that we have the collaborative effort that we need right now I think that if there are things that are effective at improving the quality of education things that are effective at uh, increasing the achievement level of students that it should be shared between both schools whether it's a charter or a public school or well, excuse me whether it's a public charter school or a traditional public school, I think that we can work together to make, to share ideas and share strategies that are uh, proven successful in our classrooms. And I think we need to do more of that because we, we all have one objective and that is to see that the students are succeeding. And I think that the more people we can bring to the table to have these discussions that are going to help us get to that level, then I think the, the better off our students will be, the better off our communities and our parents will be. Absolutely. We've, you know, got no just, we've got just yeah. about a minute left, but what, what, what's, what's the holdup? Well, no doubt. I mean, you know, we just, we just got out of a legislative session. It, it, it was a lot of rankering, right? I'm so happy, Deborah. first of all, that you're doing this program and you have the likes of us on, on, on stage here because enough of the Republican versus Democrat, enough right. of the traditional school versus public charter school, now that the elimination of the capital charter schools is here, we have to deal with it, and it's so good for us now to once and for all be able to have that free flow. Uh, public charter schools learn from our traditional schools and vice versa. Right. And I think that uh, one of the obstacles in the past has been the misconception that NCAE uh, was opposed to charter schools or opposed lifting the cap of charter schools when that's not that's not the fact at all. I think that that misconception has put a block between the collaboration that we could have going between both uh, traditional public schools and public and uh, charter public charter schools excuse me but um, now that we are at a point where we can say look there's no time for us to waste battling one another over who's right or who's wrong about the best uh, strategies for providing quality education for our students. I think that we can move forward and have some very, very productive discussions. And look for I look forward to working collaboratively with with Daryl and uh, making sure that we can provide a quality education for every student in North Carolina, not just any particular group, not just uh, any particular school. But every school needs to be able to be successful because these kids represent the future of this state. Well, let us hope that. Indeed, success is down the road for, for all students concerned. And I really appreciate you 
all three being here. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank Daryl Allison, Rodney Ellis, and Simon Johnson for joining us this afternoon. For more information on today's topic and guests, visit us online at unctv.org slash BIF. You'll find links to email us your comments and join us as fans of BIF on Facebook, or you can call us on the BIF line at 919-549-7167. Be sure to meet us right back here each Sunday afternoon at 4.30. For Black Issues Forum, I'm Deborah Holt-Noel. Thank you for spending your time with us. Quality Public Television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV.